Hello and welcome to a brand new Arse Blog Arsecast right here on arsblog.com. How are you? Hope you're well. Thank you very much indeed, as always, for being here. Sorry, what? Sorry, I just, uh, sorry, I've been interrupted there uh, because I, I've been hit with an FA charge. Apparently, I'm guilty of undisguised devotion and support of Arsenal Football Club, and I have until the end of this podcast to respond. Hmm. They're really going all in at the moment, this this so-called FA. Anyway, it is North London Derby weekend. Away from home, of course, where our record has not been the greatest, it's fair to say. So we're going to talk a little bit about that in a while with our guest, Charles Watts, who's coming up now in a moment. We're also going to chat a bit about the new artwork at the Arsenal Stadium, uh, revealed this week after a major consultation between the club and fans and fan groups and, and all the rest. And I think what they've come up with is really quite striking and different and dynamic. And I think it really does represent Arsenal in a really positive way. Uh, the Arsenal of now, the Arsenal that will go into the future without losing any of what we are made of, our history, our, our traditions, the foundations, if you like, that have uh, brought us to where we are. And uh, you're kidding. And another one. Are you, fuck's sake. Just been slapped with uh, another FA charge. Apparently now it's not the done thing to hold Tottenham in open contempt. So be careful out there, folks. You too could be on the wrong end of the the relentless whip of the FA. Got till the end of the podcast to respond, etc., etc. But look, as I was saying, it is the North London Derby. It's a huge game, particularly in the context of this season. And ah, come on, another one. This time for being a telltale. Fuckers. I think we should just get on with the show. Let's do that. We've got plenty to talk about. Like I said, we've got the stadium artwork. We've got transfer business. We've got the Derby itself to talk about. So with me to do that, hopefully uninterrupted by any further FA charges, from Goal.com, it's Charles Watts. Hi, Charles. Hi, Andrew, mate. How's it going? It's going pretty well. You were there on Wednesday night to see the unveiling of the new artwork, which is going to be installed at the Arsenal Stadium in the coming weeks, replacing the, the artwork that was there when the stadium was built back in, what, 2006. And then those those artworks were installed a little bit later on. They'd faded with time. How was the event, first and foremost? Because there did seem to be a, a great collection of people there from Arsenal Legends to people involved in the in the process and I'm sure we can talk about that now in a moment the way all this came together yeah no it was a really good event I I mean there's so many so many faces there it's difficult to sort of list them off you know from George Graham Tony Adams Alan Smith Lee Dixon uh, Pat Rice I mean there was just so many and mm. um, obviously some of the current crop Martin Odegaard was there Edu Vinay Richard Garlick Tim Lewis it was you know there was so many people there lots of faces from you know sort of fan base as well and um it was just it was a really good event and and it was just great walking around and seeing how happy everyone was i mean, I mean a lot of the people <laughs> in that room were obviously involved in the process mm. of of choosing these designs and i think they can all be very very proud of themselves for what they've helped put together from the club to the artists to the fans who are involved in the in the workshops that were held and it's re these things are really difficult, isn't it? And, yeah. you know, I was convinced. I saw, I saw the designs last week. We had a sort of briefing uh, ahead of it. And I saw them last week and I liked them. But I thought there's going to be people that just, you know, as we way with these things are not going to like it, are going to kick off about one player not being on it and, and, and things like that. But, you know, on the whole, I think the reaction has been really, really positive. And for something this big and potentially this divisive, I think that says an awful lot about the process behind it and how how well they've done in, in choosing these designs. I yeah. think they've done a really, really good job. Um, we, we've got a video on Ars Blog News. Tim Stillman is sort of explaining a little bit about how the, the process began and, and basically the, the blank slate that he talks about and that the club have talked about was literally that, where they just sort of got people together and said, what does Arsenal mean to you? What do you think of when you think of this, et cetera, et cetera. And from there, they've come up with these these designs. Um, I mean, like you, I, I saw them last week and I thought they were pretty cool, but I hadn't seen them in, in sort of enough resolution to really get 
uh, a good look at them, but the subjective nature of artwork, particularly when it comes to football clubs, you know, you, you release a new kit every year or a new third kit and people are like, oh, what are we, oh, that's disgusting. That kit is absolutely horrible. And then there's other people who are going, that's an amazing kit. I love that. You know, so by by its nature, this kind of stuff divides people as it is. But I think it's really incredible how, well, not unanimous, but how overwhelmingly positive the the reaction has been to these. Because this easily could have gone wrong and the club could have taken a much easier route to go down when it comes to uh, the facade of the, of the stadium. They could have been safe, couldn't they? But they weren't. They took a gamble. They took a risk. And I, I think the fact that in a period where we have been talking about sort of reconnecting the club, reconnecting with the fans and not just the fans in the stadium. I mean, this is just part of a part of the wider picture of how the club has tried to reconnect with, with fans after some difficult years. Yeah, absolutely. I think they've done a really good job. I was talking to Vinay about it at the at the event yesterday and how, like you said, at the very start, it was completely a, a sort of blank page that they started from and that's how they wanted to do it. They didn't want to go there and like give fans a selection of of sort of designs to pick from and to pick mm. their best, you know, to pick their favourites from. They wanted it to start from fresh to get all the input to understand what Arsenal meant to fans now you know some of the moments in history that they absolutely wanted the players they wanted and things like that and then start and, and, and put it all together and I think they've done it well and I think when Arsenal do come together and do this they do it really really well and maybe as a sort of bias to it but you, you, I kind of look at it and I, I think when when they actually do get that put their heads together and try and come up with this thing they, they do it it feels like they do it better than most clubs and and they've done it again with this one and I'm, I'm intrigued to see what they look like when they're actually on the stadium it, you know, on some of them. I mean, the hybrid one's fantastic. I absolutely love the hybrid one. I think they're going to make a mint out of that because it, it's clearly that's going to be printed up and sold in the shops. And, and, yeah. stuff. and I think so many people will want that on, on their walls, in their offices and in their houses. I think they'll make a mint. I think it's a brilliant design. Um, and, and like, the, the, I'm intrigued what the fan, the sort of banners and flags one's going to look like when it's all up there. Mm. It, I, I was looking at it yesterday. It looks great. And you spend ages looking and picking out different banners, but what, what it's going to look like from maybe a distance that big, you know, cause there's lots of different colors, you know, sure. I, I'm intrigued to see how that's going to look, but, um, you know, on the whole, I think they've done a really, really good job and, and, and seeing the players there who are involved in it yesterday and how proud they are to be on there and that the sort of inclusivity that they've done, you know, it's not just the men's team, it's about the women's team. And this has all come from the workshops in terms of, what Arsenal means now in 2023, what perhaps it didn't in 2006 when mm. they started these designs and how it's moved forward. And they knew that a lot of people really wanted, you know, it to be far more inclusive on those, uh, on the designs. And I think they've really, really nailed it. And, and yeah, fair play. Congratulations to everyone involved in it. Yeah. I mean, I think everyone's done a, a fantastic job and I think that's a really good point because, you know, it's 2023. The world is a different place from, 2003 even but when you go back to Arsenal's history and you look at Highbury and you look at the the details on that Highbury one are just amazing aren't they you know the back four with their hands in the air and Arson's there George Graham is there I like the one of um, Bob Wilson and David Seaman you know uh, real nods to the history but you also have to look to the future you have to be a club that looks forward and and how do you um, you know for some people I was. I wrote about this on the blog today, Thursday, when we were talking about it. You know, there's people who've only known the new stadium. They've only known the Emirates. And, uh, you know, it doesn't feel like that long, but it's coming up on 17 years now, mm. which is, you know, uh, <laughs> it's scary. kind of, it is scary. <laughs> yeah, for us in particular, it's kind of scary because we remember um, older times than that. And, and time has flown, though 17 years appear to have flown. But, you know, for all the, the, the fans of a certain age who grew up with Highbury, whose first experience was Highbury, uh, you know, there are fans whose first experience is, is the Emirates and, and all that that entails. And, and to show that, you know, there is greater inclusivity, um, not just for, for fans, but for, uh, you know, for the women's team, um, their achievements up there. Um, you know, I think it's, I think it's great. And, uh, you know, the way that this club can really strike the right note uh, with things like this is, is amazing. And I think the other thing I would just say finally is that I, it's so different. I can't think of another stadium in the world that's going to look like this. I mean, I could be wrong. I mean, you see all these incredible futuristic stadiums and amazing looking uh, arenas around the world and everything else, but I can't think of one which 
will be as as um, distinctive as this, I think is the word I'm looking for. Yeah, I think so. That's why I'm really intrigued what it's actually going to look like when they're all in place because obviously we've seen the banners. And, and at the event yesterday, they had, say, like, you know, the 1886 one. It's, I think it's got always forward in the little red current strip across the middle. They had that on the wall. But then next to it, they had the sort of actual size of what the just the A on always um, mm. forward was going to and the difference and it's you sort of look at that and realize oh my god it's going to be so huge compared to what you're looking at now when it's actually up there and um it's going to be so striking you know visually impressive you think of the one that's going to be above the away entrance which is uh you know the sort of cannons you know with keown and mm. brightly and and everyone and you sort of think when you're walking over that bridge towards it and you're looking at it it's going to be so imposing and visually visually striking um it's going to be really impressive and the one that's going to be positioned next to the train track so when you're arriving from the north of england you're going into king's cross you're just going to be met with that huge um welcome to the emirates or whatever it is home of home of so i know welcome Mm. to north london isn't it and then home of home of the arsenal and you're just going to have that right out your train window at, at you. It's you know it's going to be really impressive, I think, and I'm really looking forward to it. It's a shame that the weather's crap out here at the moment because they just started work on it today. But unfortunately, yeah. it's tipping it down rain. It's windy, and so they're not going to be able to do it. The plan was to start today, but they're hoping to have at least a couple of them in place for the United game next weekend, which would be good. So you're probably looking what another week, maybe two after that, before all later up. But um, but yeah, it's going to look great. Yeah, yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, to getting over and seeing these things in in their full aspect and to get the full effect of them as well. You know, as good as the designs are and the pictures that you get, you know, to see them on the side of the stadium will be will be absolutely fantastic. Before we move on, um, there's some breaking news just before we started recording. Here is that Arsenal have been hit with an FA charge again. Um, regulation and discipline update. Arsenal have been charged with breaching rule FA E20.1 during its tie against Oxford United in, in the FA Cup on Monday, 9th of January 2023. It's alleged that Arsenal failed to ensure their players con- uh, conducted themselves in an orderly fashion during the 34th minute, and the club has until Monday, 16th of January to respond. And this, of course, follows on the, the same charge that was levelled at Arsenal for the um, the penalty appeal at the end of the, the game against Newcastle, the nil-nil game against Newcastle. This also was for a penalty appeal in the 34th minute when I think it was um, an Albert Sambi Lokonga shot was brilliantly saved by one of the Oxford players. I think had we had VAR, we, we didn't, but had we had VAR, I think there would have been a very good case for a penalty. When I mentioned this to you, you just started laughing. Um you were there. So, I mean, did you see anything in the way that the Arsenal players conducted themselves that led you to believe that an FA charge would be levelled at the club? <laughs> Not a chance. <laughs> it's, it's mad. It is genuinely crazy. It's, it's one of those ones when, when you said it, when we were just starting and you told me it and, and I thought, you, I just, what? I just couldn't believe it. It was just a handball appeal. Yeah, they sort of, a few of them were around the referee, but you see it all the time when it's a, you know, one of those handballs where you can tell the players really think this is the penalty mm. and they're all just going around say, saying it. And it was no more than that. It was, it's, it's mad. Honestly, I'm just looking at the reaction on Twitter at the moment. James, you know, gunner vlog is he's saying exactly the same to me. It's just, this is mad. And it genuinely is. It feels, it feels vindictive almost that this one, I could kind of understand the, the Newcastle one, although I wasn't sure about it, I'm not sure how you can charge Arsenal and not Newcastle after that game. But mm. to this one, it's difficult not to look at it and think it almost feels a little bit like vindictive and and just uh, yeah, it's all I can say really. I, I thought you you made a great point earlier off air when you were saying you know in, in a way this might actually help Arsenal. It's the whole adds to the siege mentality type. Um, yeah feel that has kind of been building a th- I think a little bit around the club in the last couple of weeks and this is certainly going to only going to add to that because I mean because this has happened just now I haven't had a chance to speak to anyone about about it at Arsenal but you know I got the, after after the uh, first charge after Newcastle game they were you know pretty they were like, there's no point appealing there's, there's not really a point but I, I wonder if they're going to Mm. appeal this one because it just this one just feels really really over the top to me yeah it is the third one of course this season because there was one after the Leeds away game when I think they were awarded a penalty and then that penalty was overturned very late in the game and there was a charge down which I think the club just acknowledged and paid a, a 20,000 pound fine and look I you know I can see from 
from inside, like in the dressing room, if I'm Mikel Arteta, if I'm, you know, uh, getting my team ready for a North London derby, I'm sort of talking to them about, you know, look at the way they're treating us, look at this, you know, uh, it is that us and them thing, which I think can be really, really uh, useful for a club and for a group of players, you know, and I think there's no question that this is already a consolidated uh, group, you know, they're very tight, they're very determined, they're very together. So I can see how there might be some benefits of that, but I do also have some fear that heading into a North London derby where there have been some questionable decisions made down the years that, I don't know, I feel a little uneasy about it at the same time. Do you worry a little bit that some of this might then carry into the way the game is officiated on Sunday or is that just us sort of like looming off into into sort of vague conspiracy theory but you know you think back to that Cedric penalty last season you're like come on what's going I on mean, here I mean the- I really don't need any more uh, issues when it comes to giving away penalties or uh, against Tottenham because all they have to do is breathe on a player at a white lane yeah. or whatever you call that stadium now and, and they give away I mean the Cedric one I still I was watching it earlier today that Cedric one again. How could you put yourself? I mean, I've it. never, I've never seen a penalty given for that incident apart from in that game, ever. It just, it just never happens. And I mean, how many, how many penalties has Kane got in his last ten games against Arsenal? Seven hundred and forty, something like that. Exactly, it feels like that. And um, yeah, I mean, it might well do. Yeah, so the Cedric one at the end of last season was ridiculous, but Arsenal did lose their heads in that game as well you know at, at the end of it you had to kind of look at the way they they approached it how fired up they were for it how the, the Rob Holding and Son incidents were clear for all to see you could see that coming from the touchline that he was going to get sent off mm. and so they they did lose their heads so they, they'll have to they, they need to be sensible with the way they approach things but I think they're certainly going to have in the back of their head, back of their minds what's going to go, happen with the referee I, I'm intrigued to see what Arteta is going to say about this at Colney tomorrow because sure you know, he, he doesn't he knows that everyone's focusing on what he's saying at the moment and what his behaviour is like on the touchline. And he's probably thinking, you know, I need to be on my best behaviour a little bit. But I'm sure he's going to be quite tempted to to go in on this a little bit tomorrow because he must feel very, very hard done by after this one. Yeah, I would agree. But then it's like, do you, by confronting that, make it worse, you know, in the minds of the referees or the referee, the PGMOL? Um, you know, far be it for me to suggest that they might have a predetermined narrative um, when it comes to officiating certain games or certain players. But yeah, it is a, it is a tricky one for him to deal with. But, you know, I can understand feeling kind of hard done by in this one because, you know, there have been question marks, haven't there, about Arsenal's discipline under Mikel Arteta down the years, uh, you know, since he took over. There have been a lot of red cards. Mm. And, you know, I'm touching wood here now, but I think in general... This season, we've seen a much more disciplined Arsenal. We haven't had the red card. Now, some of that is getting rid of some of the players who are kind of red card magnets. <clears throat> David Luiz saying no names. But, you know, another part of it, I think, is the fact that this is a, an Arsenal team that is in, is much more in control of the games that they're playing. So those moments of desperation, those late challenges, whatever it might be, aren't really there anymore. So it's kind of counterintuitive that Arsenal have been hit three times with an FA charge in a season where overall the disciplinary record has been far better. Yeah. I, mean, I, I don't think they've had a record this season, have they? Just off the top of my head. I don't think I don't think they have. I'm pretty sure. I can't recall one if they have, um, which is you know huge, huge improvement on what we've seen in previous seasons under Arteta. I think a lot of them last season, though, they were, like you said, they were kind of last ditch challenges. They were silly instance it wasn't because they were overly dirty or anything mm. like that I've never felt like this Arsenal team is a dirty side they just got punished for doing some stupid things at times and they've certainly they've, you know they've sorted that out this season without a doubt and they had to because they couldn't keep playing games with 10 men you're not going to win games in a Premier League if you've got 10 men uh, or not going to win many games anyway so they they had to sort that out after last season and mm. and they've done that and that's why again it just feels I mean three charges from the FA this season when they've doesn't feel like they've really put a foot put a foot wrong. Yeah, I, I think the siege mentality is going to be certainly coming into this. So you think back to think back to nineteen ninety one. I know a lot of people listening to this weren't weren't around then and in, in that season, but you know George played that absolutely perfectly, and the, he got the players 
he, he, that famous the famous uh, speech mm. he gave at Colney. Well, actually, was it Colney then? I think it was the other trainer, the next door trainer. It was, wasn't point. it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, the famous speech that he gave to him after the after the two points were deducted at United, and he played it absolutely perfectly. And the players made light of light of that that sort of issue they ran into there. And hopefully, hopefully, Arteta can do the same with this one. Yeah, I was just looking at the uh, Premier League website. Um... And it said that Arsenal have had one red card, but the only red card incident was the Gabriel one where, going back to that Leeds game, where he wasn't he given a second yellow and then it was rescinded? It was rescinded, yeah. So, yeah, we haven't had a red card, so fingers crossed. Um, there's no more of that. We will talk a little bit about the upcoming North London derby, but obviously there's focus on, on the squad and what we might do to augment the squad between now and the end of the window. And there's a lot of people saying the right things. I saw Vinay talking about how, you know, the club are always open to the opportunities in a transfer window, et cetera, et cetera. It is, I think, fair to say at this point that there won't be any reinforcement before the derby. No, no, <laughs> unless, unless something comes but a real bolt from the blue in the next uh, few hours or so, which yeah. I'm certainly not expecting. It's, uh, it's going to be as you were for the derby um no ideally Arsenal would have got people in by now I think Mikel's made it very very clear that he wanted things would he hoped that things were going to get done early in the window but unfortunately as tends to be the way with Arsenal they get sucked into these sagas don't they during a transfer window it's never an easy mm. one you don't you don't often have the Fabio Vieira type transfers when it comes to Arsenal do you it always ends up being a little bit of a saga and that's how this pursuit of of Madrid is beginning to turn into and what are we now 12th of January so we're not even halfway through the month yet but um it's it just feels like from speaking to people around the both clubs it just feels like one that's gonna it could well drag for a little bit a little bit longer yet it's a bit of a we're at, we're at the poker stage at the moment and I don't think it's really moved on. I know there were reports earlier on in the week that we were, you know, it moved forward and mm. things were looking a lot more positive. I'm not sure that's that's the case in terms of really sort of anything really leaping forward. I think we're still kind of in the same way. As far as Darnell, we're still in the same position we were at the start of the week, which was one club's got one valuation, the other club's got another valuation neither of them are particularly close at the moment and we'll, we'll have to wait and see what happens. The talks continue. Joe Felix going to Chelsea. Um, he was a player that Arsenal were definitely interested in. And there was talk about how Arsenal wanted to do that before the Mudrick deal, you know, to sort of bring somebody in and maybe take some of the pressure off the, the Mudrick negotiations. What's your sense of, or your information regarding potential alternatives? Because Arteta was pretty up front, wasn't he, after the Oxford game where when he was talking about Eddie and talking about how well Eddie did, he said, well, the the, the problem is we've only got one striker. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. Um, I mean, do you get the sense that maybe they might be looking at something else? That if they were interested in Felix, they might have an alternative target or two up their sleeves that isn't quite as public as that? I mean, you would you would think so. The, the, the only thing I've, a little bit odd with that is I don't think you're looking at, if you were looking at Felix, you're looking at him to come in and be a striker and sort of take the burden off Eddie. He's just not really mm. that sort of player. And look, I'm not an expert when it comes to Jao Felix. I haven't seen him that much, but certainly in my mind, when I think of him, I don't think of him as a number nine in it, playing in that Arsenal position, in that Arsenal system that Arteta does. So, yeah, I'm... I'd be surprised if they're not looking at other targets. I mean, the priority is very much Mudrick, but you would kind of think if they can get someone else in that, that would help the squad between now and the end of the season, they will. Jao Felix always felt like Chelsea to me from the very start. It just had them written all over it. You know, he was being offered around to everyone. He was very much on the market. It was going to cost a lot of money to borrow him basically for five months. It just had Chelsea written all over it yeah. to me. And, the way that Arsenal kind of operate now and the long-term strategy that they have when it comes to transfer market, it just, it didn't feel like one that I ever really thought was going to happen um, because of the finances involved. And so I wasn't, I wasn't surprised to see him end up at Chelsea, to be honest, because, I mean, it's just a lot of money, isn't it? For mm. someone who you're going to have to acclimatise to the Premier League, he's not Premier League ready. You're basically paying, I mean, there's a little bit of discrepancy about what the actual figures 
were in the end, but you're looking at about 15, 16 million for a player you're going to have for five months that you're not going to sign at the end of it and who's going to have to adjust. So I, I don't know, it just didn't feel like something Arsenal would do to me. Yeah, same. It feels a bit pato, maybe. Remember when he went to Chelsea yeah. and it was like, ooh, that could be good. But I mean, I could be wrong. And, you know, he's obviously a very talented player. It's about how quickly he can he can settle down. We had a load of questions actually on Monday for the or Tuesday for the Arscast Extra, which we didn't get around to as much. And I saw you reporting on um, a reported Arsenal target, Danilo, um, in Brazil and how he's uh, in talks with a, a Premier League club. I think it's Nottingham Forest. Is that right? Um, yeah, it's Forest. Yeah. Um, and we had a lot of questions about whether or not Arsenal might do something with regard central midfield in, in this particular window. I mean, there are options. There's no two ways about it. They've got El Neni, they've got Partey, they've got Granit Xhaka, they've got Albert Sambi Lukonga, and you do have Martin Odegaard who could play in there. Maybe Emile Smith Rowe could play in there uh, as well. But you would have maybe some questions as to how much faith Arteta has in someone like uh, Lukonga uh, at this moment in time. Um, and with hopefully a lot more football to play between now and May, we had a lot of questions about whether or not the club are in the market for a, a central midfielder. Do you have any information or any insight into whether that might be something they're looking at now? Or is it kind of analogous to the the situation last January where they they needed a striker, but were willing to hold on to get the player that they wanted in the summer, you know, so maybe the the player that they've got earmarked for central midfield could be the kind of deal that's only doable in the summer. And therefore, if you bring somebody in now, you kind of make it more difficult to do that one. Yeah, I mean, if they have got an, a target for midfield, then I don't know who it is. Unfortunately, that's certainly not saying that they don't have one. They, they could mm. well do, but it's not, I've not, I've not heard a name. Danilo, I know that they haven't followed up their interest in him since September. And, um, you know, there was interest there in the summer, but um, they haven't followed that up. So they've obviously moved on, you would think, to other targets because he was available. Could well be going to Forest. I don't think it's done yet, but mm. he, he could well go to Forest. Um, they wanted Douglas Louise, obviously, in the summer. They tried to get him right at the end of the window. That's, you know, he signed a new contract, so that's not going to happen. So, look, I think ideally, for me, I think they get they should get another midfielder in. Um, I think they need it. I think the drop off from party is so big that should something happen to him between now and the end of the season, and when you look at his fitness record since he's come here, you can't, you couldn't be totally confident that something won't. Then that is a big concern to me because I just think the drop off so big. I, I like El Denny, and I think he's, you know, he's a great professional. He's very popular. He does his job when he comes in, but he's no Thomas Party. And if you're suddenly looking at for the next, if you know. Party pulls his hamstring and he's out for six weeks, two months, and you've got El Nenny holding midfield. I think the drop off's so big that Arsenal would find it very, very difficult to maintain the sort of form that we've seen so far this season. So, ideally for me, I think the winger is absolutely essential. I think it's more essential than the forward, um, a striker. So, I can see why Madrid is a priority, but I'd be absolutely targeting a midfielder as well yeah. if, uh, if I were on the board. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't disagree with that. The The only thing I would say is it's it feels like one of those where it's kind of easier said than done, isn't it? You know, you get, go get a midfield who is nearly as good as Thomas Partey, um, which is kind of hard, you yeah, know, and expensive. They, kind of, they would arrive knowing that they're not going to play really unless Thomas Partey is injured, which isn't, is, yeah. you know, it's not the most tempting of proposition. For a lot of players, it's like, come here, but you're not really going to play. Yeah, it's tough, isn't it? I mean, that does make it tough for all the talk that we have or, or all the desire that everybody would have for us to do something in that area. The realities and the practicalities of it are are, are something that, you know, the club obviously have to consider. You know, as fans, we can just say, I should go, should go get a player, go get any, you know, we all um, can... Uh, talk about how important it is to bring that player in, but but trying to find that player in the market and, and um, reassure them that if they did come in, they weren't just going to sit there. Because if it is somebody who's just going to sit there, you might as well stick with what, we, with what you've got. Um, and it, it sort of bleeds in then to the to the long term planning and the the strategy that the club have put in place in terms of how they recruit. So not just they won't bring in just anybody. We know that. But it's finding that balance between the needs of the squad and, and the realities of the market. Yeah, I think the biggest worry for them will be the 
sort of progress of Lukonga in the two years since he's arrived, really, mm. because I'm not sure he's really moved on anywhere from where he was when he arrived. And I'm still no sort of closer to really working out exactly what he is and, you know, what sort of midfielder he's going to turn into. And he, it's not like he's not had opportunities. He's had plenty. He's played a lot of games and, you know, he's neat and tidy. But he's not much. I've not seen that he's much more than that. I don't know if he's more of a defensive player. I don't know if he's more of a, a number eight. And if that's just a little bit of a worry because they spent a lot of money on him and he's been here for a couple of years now and you'd have hoped that he would maybe be putting a little bit more pressure on the likes of Xhaka or, mm. or, or party. And, you know, he's absolutely not, you know, he's still, no one's calling for Lukonga to play each week, are they? And that, I think that will be a concern of the club. And it's certainly something they're going to have to think about approaching the summer window in terms of what exactly they want to do in that midfield area. Yeah. Um, as I say, I, I just watched him again against Oxford and it's not easy because you're always coming into a team that's been much changed. You're not always playing with the best players because Whenever you do play, you tend to be in the sort of second string. So it's not easy. But I'd just still like to have seen a little bit more th- from him in these two years or 18 months that he's been at the club th- in terms of progress being made. Yeah, same. Just like even glimpses of something that makes you go, oh, oh, rather than like, oh, God, that's another game that's sort of not passed him by, but where he hasn't really stood out. And I take your point, you know, about coming into a changed team and a much changed team in the Europa League and certainly a much changed team against uh, Oxford the other night. But at the same time, you need players to, to sort of step up and take their chances mm-hmm. to show that they're, to show that they're capable. Um, speaking of somebody who might make an impact, Emil Smith-Rowe is back, got some minutes against Oxford. I think he looked... I think he looked quite lean and strong, a bit rusty on the ball, but that's only to be expected after so long out. But how important do you think he could be in this second half of the season? And when Arsenal are looking for depth in attacking positions, he can play left, he can play right. We know Mikel Arteta has spoken about him as a, as a false nine and, and all the rest of it. I would say more as a sort of contingency plan than sort of, you know, an active plan, if if that makes sense. But he is somebody who, you know, the, the circumstances of his uh, return are, are quite different from when he came into the team. Because when he came into the team, it was like, this is last throw of the dice stuff here because we were on that terrible run. He came in, played really well, became important, but now he's He's coming back into a team that's been playing extremely well. It's top of the table. It's a different kind of challenge for him. Do you think in some ways, obviously the the fact that he's finally corrected a, or they finally corrected an injury he's had since he was 18 or 19, which is kind of incredible in itself. Um, do you think this might be these three months, four months that he's been on the sidelines? I don't mean to say like a wake-up call or anything like that, but sometimes you need things to really, really focus you on on your job and what you've got to do as a footballer and how quickly football can change around you because last season he was our second highest goal scorer when he's fit, he plays. Now it's like, well, you're not getting in ahead of Martinelli right now, not getting in ahead of Saka, you're not getting in ahead of Eddie. You know, so he, he's really going to have to work hard and put his head down to try and uh, start games again. I think that, you know, could really be a positive thing. Yeah, 100%. I'm... I'm- Really happy Smith Rowe's back. I think if, and it is a big if because we don't know yet, you know, the, the injury is totally cleared up because we'll have to see what how it goes once he's playing regularly week in, week out, if it flares up again or not. But hopefully they've fixed it. And if it, if you know, if you've got a fit and fire in Emil Smith Rowe available to you, it's such a massive boost. I mean, you, you go back to when he did burst into, into the side and the difference he was making, the goals he was scoring, the runs he was making. You know, you add that into this Arsenal squad now and just the option off the bench to have him there or the option to start him and be able to rest an Odegaard, rest a Martinelli, something we've, you know, Arsenal haven't been able to do because they've just not had the options. It's It'll be absolutely huge. It's such a cliche, the whole like a new signing thing, but it generally will be, won't it? Because we <laughs> yeah. haven't had that option for the first half of the season. And it will be massive. And um, he's, clearly we're going to have to give him a little bit of time. I mean, I'd like to say that I watched any of his 15 minute cameo at the, uh, on Monday night but I managed to delete everything I'd written during the second half at, at, with about 20 minutes to go at Oxford and was in a <laughs> blind panic trying to rewrite it all and basically didn't see any of the last How 15 minutes of the game 
it was a nightmare moment oh my and, god um, so yeah i basically i didn't see any of that game. last 20 minutes of the game i was just looking down at my computer in sheer panic um, it was a good job the first half was basically a one line thing yeah, yeah that was really that was that terrible <laughs> um but um it was great to see him just out on the pitch again and i i agree with you i think it's so different to the position he's coming into now and he must have sat there I and mean, he spoke about it after the game when he spoke to the, the reporters and you know he said it, it was it's been really tough to watch but he can't complain because he's coming into a team top of the table and that's right i mean it must have been really difficult to him but mm. on the sort of flip side of that to be able to come into this team that's playing well that's creating chances that's scoring goals i mean it's a massive thing isn't it you're not i think as a player you'd much rather come into a team that's flying high and doing really really well than come into a team that is basically had the worst start in their premier league history and is flirting relegation and that's what he did do and he took to that really well was mm. basically him and Saka Arsenal savior that season you would hope that he can come into this and just fit straight back in again and and be that option if, if it is off the bench that could make a real real difference and I think he's got a massive part to play in the second half of the season really really big part to play and you know Arsenal have been very very careful with him you can tell when Arteta talks about him how he doesn't want to put too much pressure on him but you can just tell Arteta is desperate to get him mm. have him available again so um, I think he's got a massive part to play over the second half of the season. Smith Rowe, huge. He did say, but not as number nine, no. not as a false nine. Well, look, I, you know, <laughs> I, 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 you know, it wouldn't be my first choice, but you know, if if needs must, I would, I would back him to do better in that position in this team than the team he played false nine in. Um, you know, in that in that semi final against Villarreal, because that was a fucking shambles of a yeah. of a team. It was a shambles, you know. And I think we're much more solid. Now. If you get to do that, yeah, you play for me. You play Martinelli as a nine, and you move Smith Rowe to the left. One. Well, exactly. I, I that's what I would do. I'm just saying that you know, if it comes down to it, and uh, if push comes to shove, I think he would be more effective in that role um, this time around. But you know, hopefully Eddie oh, stays fit. Nightmares keeps going. that Villarreal game. I just had so many flashbacks to that 90 minutes oh that was so bad it was but you know the team was was a mess as well it let's was. face it you know Shaq at left back it was Chambers at right back Rob Holding and Pablo Marie the centre of your defence that's not what you want in a European semi-final it's it's fair yeah. to say the glory days yeah the glory days I mean the, 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 the thing that he talked about afterwards how he's had this injury basically his entire career sometimes you forget I mean I think there's a, a a perception that like if a footballer's out on the pitch he's 100% fit you know but the reality is footballers are out there and they're not 100% fit they could be anywhere between sort of 90% fit and 60% fit they're always carrying little aches and strains and niggles here and there and 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 what have you and clearly most of his arsenal career smith rowe has to some extent or another been um, feeling that that groin injury, you know, there've been times where you know games where he's gone down, and we've been like, "Is he okay?" And he gets back up again, he goes again, and and what have you. It is one of those things that 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 fans don't really or not not often take into consideration is the physical well being of players because we just assume right, you're out there, you're feeling a hundred percent, go do it. But you know, Smith Rowe has kind of laid bare what the reality is for for many players that they're playing through pain discomfort all the time yeah and mentally that's got to be very very difficult especially for someone like mm. smith rose kind of relies a little bit on that explosive pace and driving runs forward and if you're not 100 percent confident in your body that must be really really difficult mentally i think mm. especially for a young player as well and you know they really had to manage him i mean i'm not no medical expert and but you do wonder don't you it's like could they could you not have just taken the decision to operate a little bit earlier i know clubs and everyone sort of op operating is the last resort. You always want to avoid putting a player under mm. the knife. But so many times with these sorts of injuries, they always end up in an operation anyway that you just think, oh, can you have just done it a year ago and, yeah. and kind of got it out of the way? But, you know, they didn't. They chose to manage it. And, well, I mean, for a time, it worked really well, didn't it? I mean, he was scoring goals. And, and But you could see the second half last season, especially, he was he was 70% fit. You could see it. And he wasn't training very much during the week either because of it. And you could really, really see it. And you could see it at the start of this season as well. So I think mm. ultimately they had to take the decision. And now it's just a case of sort of having your fingers crossed that it has fixed the problem and he can be injury free. Because you think how well he played mm. carrying that injury and the different, you know, the goals he was scoring when not play, clearly not playing 100% fit, then you think 
you know, that's surely that's very, very exciting for if he if he does play 100 percent fit. It's a really yeah. exciting prospect, or close to it anyway. Yeah, and, and fingers crossed he can build up his match fitness over the over the coming weeks. Um, I suppose we should talk about the uh, rather small matter of of Sunday in the North London derby. Arsenal's record at home has been good. Arsenal's record away from home, mm, not so good in the Premier League. I think you've got to go back to 2014. Thomas uh, Rosicki, wasn't it? Is Thomas that, Rosicki, that yeah. yeah I mean, the, yeah. A, a two a second minute like belter into the top corner, a brilliant goal. Um, and then 88 plus minutes of like, Jesus, can we hang on to the lead? Um, not the most enjoyable win while it was happening, but of course, when, when you get over the line, you take three points, it's amazing. I mean, do you think this is a this is a win that's overdue? We talked earlier about the Cedric penalty last season and the way that that game went. And look, I think when you talked about losing your heads or losing our heads, Rob Holding certainly um, certainly lost his and got sent off. And from there, it was always going to be it was always going to be a Tottenham win. It was a really painful one though last season because of what was at stake. Mikel Arteta's approach, I think afterwards he talked about wanting to go there, play our game, win the game, et cetera, et cetera, when maybe, maybe we might have been better off, given the team that we had available to us, being a little bit more circumspect in terms of our, in terms of our approach. How do you view the way Arsenal might approach this game against the Tottenham side who've had their... Uh, their troubles, particularly in the first half of games, Arsenal have been fast starters. Do you think that's going to play into the way Arteta sets his team out on Sunday? Oh, I think they'll absolutely go for it from the start, one hundred percent. I don't think this team knows anything different, and um, I'd be stunned if they tried to go a more pragmatic approach uh, on Sunday. I think they'll just play like they've played every single game this season. They'll be on it from the first first minute and really t- try and take advantage of any nervousness in the in the Tottenham in the Tottenham squad I, mm. I just can't see any other way that they're going to they're gonna play it and they're so confident in their ability they back themselves against anyone we saw at Old Trafford even in the game they lost this season the way they played that game the way they started that game and controlled it for the majority of the, of the match I think we'll see exactly the same sort of performance so I think it's going to be really interesting to see how Tottenham play I think they're going to have it looks like they're going to have some players back who maybe they've been missing recently like Benton Kur and, and Kulisewski so they should be stronger than they have been Um but you kind of know what you're going to get from a Conte side and the way they're going to set up. And first, guys, again, it's cliche, but it is absolutely key in this game for me. Arsenal get it. You've got a Tottenham fan base who aren't exactly loving their team at the moment and certainly aren't loving their owners at the moment. Mm. Could they turn potentially so? And, you know, when Arsenal, this, these players get a sense of victory, then they tend to go on and, and take it. It's the way they've been playing all season. So I don't think they'll be nervous at all. I think they'll they'll be loving this. And I think there's definitely, definitely going to be a part of revenge might be the wrong word, but you know, they're going to remember what happened there last time and the Mm. pain, how painful it was and how things went. And I'm sure that's going to be right at the forefront of their minds going into this one. They're going to want to put things right. I think it's just, again, the type of characters in this squad, the Ramsdales, players like that they are going to remind everyone in the dressing room what happened last time and I think they're going to be really really up for it it's overdue isn't it I mean 2014 is a long time to wait for a win at White Hart Lane particularly as we used to win there quite quite regularly you know the law of averages suggests you know it's it's about time for Arsenal to to take three points well you say that but the law of averages (laughs) suggests that it's been about time for Tottenham to take three points at Arsenal. Well, I think I've done it nah, once don't be in ridiculous. Don't be ridiculous. Years. So hopefully <laughs> this run doesn't stretch to that long. But I mean, it is, yeah, it is. I, I think I was looking at it since 2014. I think it's been in the league. It's been six defeats and two draws away. Mm. One of those was at Wembley. Um, there should have been a win. Um, but it, yeah, it's just not been a happy hunting ground for it. And this, since the new the move to the new stadium, I think it's been three straight straight defeats, hasn't it? It's not been and even lost a preseason friendly there as well. So, mm. um, yeah, it's not a place that holds happy memories. But you've got to end that at some point. And I do feel this Arsenal team is very different to every other Arsenal team that's been to this new ground since it opened. You know, it's got so much more about it. And, Agree. Uh, and they will back themselves an awful lot more than the other teams did. So, hopefully, hopefully. 
we're going to see a different result and a different type of performance. Yeah, and it's it's just very finally, it's one of those games where because Manchester City are playing on Saturday, uh, the Manchester Derby is taking place at, at Old Trafford. It's another one of those games where there's either the pressure of opportunity or the pressure of pursuit uh, when it comes to Man City, who are five points behind us, they could be two points. They could stay five points behind us. It could be an opportunity for Arsenal to to go on and, and extend that lead at, at the top of the table. I mean, that is something I think in general that we've dealt with pretty well this season. Um, and it's going to be a factor in pretty much every game in this second half of the season, isn't it? That that we're looking at what happens and, and we're having to react and we're having to, to sort of take that on board as a team and compartmentalize it and deal with that because, you know, you could go out in that pitch and think like, oh, eight points, eight points, but you've got to focus on the game on its own merits and then afterwards you can enjoy what, what, what victory might bring, you know? Yeah, and for, for all of these players, pretty much, it's something they've never had to experience before, certainly the the sort of pressure of a title race and the pressure of going into a game, like mm. you said, knowing that the rivals have either won or lost and trying to keep your lead or extend your lead. It's something that's totally new to to this young team. They've dealt with it well so far. You go back to, I don't know, Wolves just before the World Cup break, isn't it, when City had lost at home to mm. um, Brentford, wasn't it, earlier on in that day? And you thought, how are the players going to react to this? And they went and really got the job done against Wolves pretty comfortably. So they dealt with that pressure well. They've dealt with the pressure well at times when they've had to win to respond to a City result. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see what happens in that Manchester derby. Uh, it's a shame, I think, on a f- few different levels that City lost against Southampton last night in the Cup. You would have wanted two more extra games for City to be sure. squeezed in with a semi-final coming up. And I think also you sort of listening to Guardiola after the game last night was not happy and you think there's certainly going to be a response from City this weekend against United so I'm not sure that was the best thing for Arsenal that result last night at Southampton but we shall see how it pans out it's certainly a big weekend when it comes to the Premier League sure is okay well look we'll see what happens we leave it there for now though Charles thanks very much as always thanks Andrew Thank you very much indeed to Charles. You can find him on Twitter. He is at Charles underscore Watts, at Charles underscore Watts. And of course, he writes about Arsenal for goal.com. So look, that's really about that for this week's show. I haven't responded to any of these FA charges. Frankly, they can take all three of them and stick it up their bums. Don't forget, we'll have a dedicated North London Derby preview podcast over on Patreon for you. We'll have that tomorrow, Saturday, for the game that takes place on Sunday afternoon, of course. If you want to sign up, you can do that at patreon.com forward slash arsebug. Of course, a five or a month, you get access to all the extra content and it supports everything else that we do here on Arsblog. James and I will be here on Monday morning with an Arsecast Extra. And let's keep fingers crossed that the long overdue win at White Hart Lane takes place. And uh, we can have a very goodly morning on Monday morning. So until then, have yourselves a great weekend. Take it easy and we will catch you on the next one. Until then, cheers. Bye bye. Welcome back to Sky Sports News and we've got some breaking news this hour. Arsenal have been charged by the FA. It's Rule 27B, Subsection 2, Annex 41C, Paragraph 9, page 3046, in which it is stated that no football club may promote the use of foul and abusive language in its own name 
and Arsenal, by virtue of having the word arse, are in violation of said rule. The club have until January 27th to respond. And in light of this charge, we're told there's been an emergency board meeting at Scunthorpe United. More to follow. Coming up next on Sky Sports News, Harry Kane, an exclusive interview with the England captain. He'll tell us all about the penalty he knows he's going to get in the North London derby this weekend.